Chapter 7 Out of the Woods Gray first light came while Rand still trudged through the forest. At first he did not really see. When he finally did, he stared at the fading darkness in surprise. No matter what his eyes told him, he could hardly believe he had spent all night trying to travel the distance from the farm to Emmons Field. Of course, the quarry road by day, rocks and all, was a far cry from the woods by night. On the other hand, it seemed days since he had seen the black-cloaked rider on the road, weeks since he and Tam had gone in for their supper. He no longer felt the strip of cloth digging into his shoulders, but then he felt nothing in his shoulders except numbness, nor in his feet, for that matter. In between, it was another matter. His breath came in labored pants that had long since set his throat and lungs to burning, and hunger twisted his stomach into queasy sickness. Tam had fallen silent some time before. Rand was not sure how long it had been since the murmurs ceased, but he did not dare halt now to check on Tam. If he stopped, he would never be able to force himself to start out again. Anyway, whatever Tam's condition, he could do nothing beyond what he was doing. The only hope lay ahead in the village. He tried wearily to increase his pace, but his wooden legs continued their slow plod. He barely even noticed the cold or the wind. Vaguely, he caught the smell of wood smoke. At least he was almost there if he could smell the village chimneys. A tired smile had only begun on his face, though, when it turned to a frown. Smoke lay heavy in the air. Too heavy. With the weather, a fire might well be blazing away on every hearth in the village, but the smoke was still too strong. In his mind, he saw again the Trollocs on the road. Trollocs coming from the east, from the direction of Emmons Field. He peered ahead, trying to make out the first houses, and ready to shout for help at the first sight of anyone, even send Bowie or one of the Coplins. A small voice in the back of his head told him to hope someone there could still give help. Suddenly, a house became visible through the last bare branch to trees, and it was all he could do to keep his feet moving. Hope turning to sharp despair, he staggered into the village. Charred piles of rubble stood in the places of half the houses of Emmons Field. Soot-coated brick chimneys thrust like dirty fingers from heaps of blackened timbers. Thin wisps of smoke still rose from the ruins. Grimy-faced villagers, some yet in their night clothes, broke through the ashes, here pulling free a cookpot, there simply prodding forlornly at the wreckage with a stick. What little had been rescued from the flames dotted the streets. Tall mirrors and polished sideboards and high chests stood in the dust among chairs and tables, buried under bedding, cooking utensils, and meager piles of clothing and personal belongings. The destruction seemed scattered at random through the village. Five houses marched untouched in one row, while in another place, a lone survivor stood surrounded by desolation. On the far side of the wine spring water, the three huge Beltine bonfires roared, tended by a cluster of men. Thick columns of black smoke bent northward with the wind, flecked by careless sparks. One of Master Alvear's Juran stallions was dragging something Rand could not make out over the ground toward the wagon bridge and the flames. Before he was well out of the trees, a sooty-faced Hara Luhan hurried to him, clutching a woodsman's axe in one thick-fingered hand. The burly blacksmith's ash-smeared nightshirt hung to his boots, the angry red welt of a burn across his chest showing through a ragged tear. He dropped to one knee beside the litter. Tam's eyes were closed, and his breathing came low and hard. Frolics, boy, Master Luan asked in a smoke-horse voice. Here, too. Here, too. Well, we may have been luckier than anyone has a right to be. You two can credit it. He needs the wisdom. Now, where in the light is she? Egwene! Egwene, running by with her arms full of bedsheets torn into bandages, looked around at them without slowing. Her eyes stared at something in the far distance. Dark circles made them appear even larger than they actually were. Then she saw Rand and stopped, drawing a shuddering breath. Oh no, Rand! Not your father! Is he... Come, I'll take you to Nynaeve. Rand was too tired, too stunned to speak. All through the night, Emmons Field had been a haven where he and Tam would be safe. Now all he could seem to do was stare in dismay at her smoke-stained dress. He noticed odd details as if they were very important. The buttons down the back of her dress were done up crookedly, and her hands were clean. He wondered why her hands were clean when smudges of soot marked her cheeks. Master Luhan seemed to understand what had come over him. Laying his axe across the shafts, the blacksmith picked up the rear of the litter and gave it a gentle push, prodding him to follow Egwene. He stumbled after her as if walking in his sleep. Briefly, he wondered how Master Luhan knew the creatures were Trollocs, but it was a fleeting thought. If Tam could recognize them, there was no reason why Haral Luhan could not. All the stories are real, he muttered. So it seems, lad, the blacksmith said. So it seems. Rand only half heard. He was concentrating on following Egwene's slender shape. He had pulled himself together just enough to wish she would hurry, though in truth, she was keeping her pace to what the two men could manage with their burden. She led them halfway down the green to the Calder House. Char blackened the edges of its thatch, and smut stained the whitewashed walls. 
Of the houses on either side, only the foundation stones were left, and two piles of ash and burned timbers. One had been the house of Baron Thane, one of the Miller's brothers. The other had been Abel Cothans, Matt's father. Even the chimneys had toppled. Wait here, Edgwain said, and gave them a look as if expecting an answer. When they only stood there, she muttered something under her breath, then dashed inside. Matt, Rand said, is he? He's alive, the blacksmith said. He set down his end of the litter and straightened slowly. I saw him only a little while ago. It's a wonder any of us are alive. The way they came after my house in the forge, you'd have thought I had gold and jewels in there. All's but cracked one's skull with a frying pan. She took one look at the ashes of our house this morning and set out hunting around the village with the biggest hammer she could dig out of what's left of the forge, just in case any of them hid instead of running away. I could almost pity the thing if she finds one. He nodded to the Calder house. Mistress Calder and a few others took in some of those who were hurt, the ones with no home of their own still standing. When the Wisdom's seen Tam, we'll find him a bed. The inn, maybe. The mayor offered it already, but Nynaeve said the hurt folk would heal better if there weren't so many of them together. Rand sank to his knees. Shrugging out of his blanket harness, he wearily busied himself with checking Tam's covers. Tam never moved or made a sound, even when Rand's wooden hands jostled him. But he was still breathing, at least. My father. The other was just the fever talking. What if they come back? He said dully. The wheel weaves as the wheel wills, Master Luhan said uneasily. If they come back, well, they're gone now. So we pick up the pieces, build up what's been torn down. He sighed, his face going slack as he knuckled the small of his back. For the first time, Rand realized that the heavy-set man was as tired as he was himself, if not more so. The blacksmith looked at the village, shaking his head. I don't suppose today will be much of a bell time, but we'll make it through. We always have. Abruptly, he took up his axe, and his face firmed. There's work waiting for me. Don't you worry, lad. The wisdom will take good care of him, and the light will take care of us all. And if the light doesn't, well, we'll just take care of ourselves. Remember, we're two rivers folk. Still on his knees, Rand looked at the village as the blacksmith walked away. Really looked for the first time. Master Luhan was right, he thought, and was surprised that he was not surprised by what he saw. People still dug in the ruins of their homes, but even in the short time he had been there, more of them had begun to move with a sense of purpose. He could almost feel the growing determination. But, he wondered, they had seen Trollocs. Had they seen the black-cloaked rider? Had they felt his hatred? Nynaeve and Egwene appeared from the Calder house, and he sprang to his feet. Or rather, he tried to spring to his feet. It was more of a stumbling lurch that almost put him on his face in the dust. The Wisdom dropped to her knees beside the litter without giving him so much as a glance. Her face and dress were even dirtier than Egwene's, and the same dark circles lined her eyes, though her hands, too, were clean. She felt Tam's face and thumbed open his eyelids. With a frown, she pulled down the coverings and eased the bandage aside to look at the wound. Before Rand could see what lay underneath, she had replaced the wadded cloth. Sighing, she smoothed the blanket and cloak back up to Tam's neck with a gentle touch, as if tucking a child in for the night. There's nothing I can do, she said. She had to put her hands on her knees to straighten up. I'm sorry, Rand. For a moment he stood, not understanding, as she started back to the house. Then he scrambled after her and pulled her around to face him. He's dying, he cried. I know, she said simply, and he sagged with the matter-of-factness of it. You have to do something. You have to. You're the wisdom. Pain twisted her face, but only for an instant. Then she was all hollow-eyed resolve again, her voice emotionless and firm. Yes, I am. I know what I can do with my medicines, and I know when it's too late. Don't you think I would do something if I could? But I can't. I can't, Rand. And there are others who need me. People I can help. I brought him to you as quickly as I could, he mumbled. Even with the village in ruins, there had been the wisdom for hope. With that gone, he was empty. I know you did, she said gently. She touched his cheek with her hand. It isn't your fault. You did the best anyone could. I am sorry, Rand, but I have others to tend to. Our troubles are just beginning, I'm afraid. Vacantly, he stared after her until the door of the house closed behind her. He could not make any thought come, except that she would not help. Suddenly, he was knocked back a step as Egwene cannoned into him, throwing her arms around him. Her hug was hard enough to bring a grunt from him any other time. Now he only looked silently at the door behind which his hopes had vanished. I'm so sorry, Rand, she said against his chest. Light, I wish there was something I could do. Numbly, he put his arms around her. I know. I... I have to do something, Egwene. I don't know what... But I can't just let him... 
His voice broke, and she hugged him harder. Egwene! At Nynaeve's shot from the house, Egwene jumped. Egwene, I need you. And wash your hands again. She pushed herself free from Rand's arms. She needs my help, Rand. Egwene! He thought he heard a sob as she spun away from him. Then she was gone, and he was left alone beside the litter. For a moment, he looked down at Tam, feeling nothing but hollow helplessness. Suddenly, his face hardened. The mayor will know what to do, he said, lifting the shafts once more. The mayor will know. Bran Elvir always knew what to do. With weary obstinacy, he set out for the wine spring inn. Another of the Duran stallions passed him, its harness straps tied around the ankles of a big shape, draped with a dirty blanket. Arms covered with coarse hair dragged in the dirt behind the blanket, and one corner was pushed up to reveal a goat's horn. The Two Rivers was no place for stories to become horribly real. If Trollocs belonged anywhere, it was in the world outside, for places where they had Aes Sedai and false dragons, and the light alone knew what else come to life out of the tales of Gleeman. Not the Two Rivers, not Emmons Field. As he made his way down the green, people called to him, some from the ruins of their homes, asking if they could help. He heard them only as murmurs in the background, even when they walked alongside him for a distance as they spoke. Without really thinking about it, he managed words that said he needed no help, that everything was being taken care of. When they left him, with worried looks and sometimes a comment about sending Nynaeve to him, he noticed that just as little. All he let himself be aware of was the purpose he had fixed in his head. Bran Alvear could do something to help Tam. What that could be, he tried not to dwell on. But the mayor would be able to do something, to think of something. The inn had almost completely escaped the destruction that had taken half the village. A few scorch marks marked its walls, but the red roof tiles glittered in the sunlight as brightly as ever. All that was left of the peddler's wagon, though, were blackened iron wheel rims leaning against the charred wagon box, now on the ground. The big round hoops that had held up the canvas cover slanted crazily, each at a different angle. Tom Marilyn sat cross-legged on the old foundation stones, carefully snipping singed edges from the patches on his cloak with a pair of small scissors. He sat down cloak and scissors when Rand drew near. Without asking if Rand needed or wanted help, he hopped down and picked up the back of the litter. Inside? Of course, of course. Don't you worry, boy. Your wisdom will take care of him. I've watched her work since last night, and she has a deft touch and a sure skill. It could be a lot worse. Some died last night. Not many, perhaps, but any at all are too many for me. Old Fane just disappeared, and that's the worst of all. Trollocs will eat anything. You should thank the light your father is still here, and alive for the wisdom to heal. Rand blotted out the words, He is my father, reducing the voice to meaningless sound that he noticed no more than a fly's buzzing. He could not bear any more sympathy, any more attempts to boost his spirits. Not now. Not until Bran Alvere told him how to help Tam. Suddenly he found himself facing something scrawled on the end door. A curving line scratched with a charred stick. A charcoal teardrop balanced on its point. So much had happened that it hardly surprised him to find the dragon's fang marked on the door of the wine spring inn. Why anyone would want to accuse the innkeeper or his family of evil or bring the inn bad luck was beyond him. But the night had convinced him of one thing. Anything was possible. Anything at all. At a push from the gleeman, he lifted the latch and went in. The common room was empty except for Bran Elvere, and cold, too, for no one had found time to lay a fire. The mayor sat at one of the tables, dipping his pen in an inkwell with a frown of concentration on his face, and his gray-fringed head bent over a sheet of parchment. Nightshirt tucked hastily into his trousers, and bagging around his considerable waist, he absently scratched at one bare foot with the toes of the other. His feet were dirty, as if he had been outside more than once without bothering about boots, despite the cold. What's your trouble? he demanded without looking up. Be quick with it. I have two dozen things to do right this minute, and more that should have been done an hour ago. So I have little time or patience. Well, out with it. Master Alvier, Rand said. It's my father. The mayor's head jerked up. Rand! Tam! He threw down the pen and knocked over his chair as he leaped up. Perhaps the light hasn't abandoned us altogether. I was afraid you were both dead. Bella galloped into the village an hour after the Trollocs left, lathered and blowing as if she'd run all the way from the farm. And I thought, no time for that now. We'll take you upstairs. He seized the rear of the litter, shouldering the gleeman out of the way. You go get the wisdom, Master Marilyn. And tell her I said hurry, or I'll know the reason why. Rest easy, Tam. We'll soon have you in a good soft bed. Go, Gleeman, go! Tom Marilyn vanished through the doorway before Rand could speak. And Eve wouldn't do anything. She said she couldn't help him. I knew... I hoped you'd think of something. Master Alvear looked at Tam more sharply, then shook his head. We'll see, boy. We'll see. But he no longer sounded confident. Let's get him into a bed. He can rest easy, at least. Rand let himself be prodded toward the stairs at the back of the common room. 
He tried hard to keep his certainty that somehow Tam would be all right. But it had been thin to begin with, he realized, and the sudden doubt in the mayor's voice shook him. On the second floor of the inn, at the front, were half a dozen snug, well-appointed rooms with windows overlooking the green. Mostly they were used by the peddlers, or people down from Watch Hill or up from Devon Ride. But the merchants who came each year were often surprised to find such comfortable rooms. Three of them were taken now, and the mayor hurried ran to one of the unused ones. Quickly the down comforter and blankets were stripped back on the wide bed, and Tam was transferred to the thick feather mattress, with goose down pillows tucked under his head. He made no sound beyond hoarse breathing as he was moved, not even a groan. But the mayor brushed away Rand's concern, telling him to set a fire to take the chill off the room. While Rand dug wood and kindling from the wood box next to the fireplace, Rand threw back the curtains in the room, letting in the morning light, then began to gently wash Tam's face. By the time the gleeman returned, the blaze on the hearth was warming the room. She will not come, Tom Marilyn announced as he stalked into the room. He glared at Rand, his bushy white brows, drawing down sharply. You didn't tell me she had seen him already. She almost took my head off. I thought, I don't know. Maybe the mayor could do something. Could make her see. Hands clenched in anxious fists. Rand turned from the fireplace to Bran. Master Alvere, what can I do? The rotund man shook his head helplessly. He laid a freshly dampened cloth on Tam's forehead and avoided meeting Rand's eye. I can't just watch him die, Master Alvere. I have to do something. The gleeman shifted as if to speak. Rand rounded on him eagerly. Do you have an idea? I'll try anything. I was just wondering, Tom said. Tamping his long-stemmed pipe with his thumb. If the mayor knew who scrawled the dragon's fang on his door. He peered into the bowl, then looked at Tam and replaced the unlit pipe between his teeth with a sigh. Someone seems not to like him anymore. Or maybe it's his guests they don't like. Rand gave him a disgusted look and turned away to stare into the fire. His thoughts danced like the flames, and like the flames they concentrated fixedly on one thing. He would not give up. He could not just stand there and watch Tam die. My father, he thought fiercely, my father. Once the fever was gone, that could be cleared up as well. But the fever first. Only how? Rand Alvere's mouth tightened as he looked at Rand's back, and the glare he directed at the gleeman would have given a bare pause, but Tom just waited expectantly, as if he had not noticed it. It's probably the work of one of the congers or a coplin, the mayor said finally. Though the light alone knows which. They're a large brood, and if there's ill to be said of someone, or even if there isn't, They'll say it. They make Sen Bowie sound honey-tongued. That wagon load who came in just before dawn? The gleeman asked. They hadn't so much as smelled a trollic. And all they wanted to know was when festival was going to start, as if they couldn't see out the village in ashes. Master Alvier nodded grimly. One branch of the family, but none of them are very different. That fool Darl Copland spent half the night demanding I put Mistress Moraine and the Master Lan out of the inn, out of the village, as if there would be any village at all left without them. Rand had only half listened to the conversation, but this last tugged him to speak. What did they do? Why, she called ball lightning out of the clear night sky, Master Alvier replied. Sent it darting straight at the Trollocs. You've seen trees shattered by it. The Trollocs stood it no better. Moraine, Rand said incredulously, and the mayor nodded. Mistress Moraine. And Master Lamb was a whirlwind with that sword of his. His sword? The man himself is a weapon, and in ten places at once, or so it seemed. Burn me, but I still wouldn't believe it if I couldn't step outside and see. He rubbed a hand over his bald head. Winter night visits, just beginning, her hands full of presents and honey cakes and her heads full of wine. Then the dogs snarling, and suddenly the two of them burst out of the inn, running through the village, shouting about Trollocs. I thought they'd had too much wine. After all, Trollocs? Then, before anyone knew what was happening, those... those things were right in the streets with us, slashing at people with their swords, torching houses, howling to freeze a man's blood. He made a sound of disgust in his throat. We just ran like chickens with a fox in the hen yard till Master Land put some backbone into us. No need to be so hard, Tom said. You did as well as anyone could. Not every trollic lying out there fell to the two of them. Um, yes, well, Master Alvier gave himself a shake. It's still almost too much to believe. And I said I in Emmons Field. And Master Land is a warder. And I said I, Rand whispered. She can't be. I talked to her. She isn't. She doesn't. Did you think they wore signs? The mayor said wryly. I said I painted across their backs, and maybe danger, stay away. Suddenly he slapped his forehead. I said I. I'm an old fool and losing my wits. There's a chance, Rand, if you're willing to take it. I can't tell you to do it, and I don't know if I'd have the nerve if it were me. A chance? Rand said. I'll take any chance if it'll help. I said I can heal, Rand. 
Burn me, lad. You've heard the stories. They can cure where medicines fail. Gleeman, you should have remembered that better than I. Gleeman's tales are full of mice and I. Why didn't you speak up instead of letting me flail around? I'm a stranger here, Tom said, looking longingly at his unlit pipe. And Goodman Coughlin isn't the only one who wants nothing to do with I said I. Best the idea came from you. I said I, Rand muttered, trying to make the woman who had smiled at him fit the stories. Help from an I said I was sometimes worse than no help at all, so the story said, like poison in a pie. And their gifts always had a hook in them, like fish bait. Suddenly the coin in his pocket, the coin Moraine had given him, seemed like a burning coal. It was all he could do not to rip it out of his coat and throw it out the window. Nobody wants to get involved with I said I, lad, the mayor said slowly. It is the only chance I can see, but it's still no small decision. I cannot make it for you, but I have seen nothing but good from Mistress Moraine. Moraine said I, I should call her, I suppose. Sometimes, he gave a meaningful look at Tam, you have to take a chance, even if it's a poor one. Some of the stories are exaggerated in a way, Tom added, as if the words were being dragged from him. Some of them. Besides, boy, what choice do you have? None, Rand sighed. Tam still had not moved a muscle. His eyes were sunken as if he had been sick a week. I'll... I'll go find her. The other side of the bridges, the Gleeman said. Where they are disposing of the dead trollocs. But be careful, boy. I said I do what they do for reasons of their own. And they aren't always the reasons others think. The last was a shout that followed Rand through the door. He had to hold on to the sword hilt to keep the scabbard from tangling in his legs as he ran. But he would not take the time to remove it. He clattered down the stairs and dashed out of the inn, tiredness forgotten for the moment. A chance for Tam, however small, was enough to overcome a night without sleep, for a time at least. That the chance came from an eye said eye, or what the price of it might be, he did not want to consider. And as for actually facing an eye said eye, he took a deep breath and tried to move faster. The bonfire stood well beyond the last houses to the north and the west side of the road to Watch Hill. The winds still carried the oily black columns of smoke away from the village, but even so, a sickly sweet stink filled the air, like a roast left hours too long on the spit. Rand gagged at the smell, then swallowed hard when he realized its source. A fine thing to do with Beltine fires. The men tending the fires had cloths tied over their noses and mouths, but their grimaces made it plain the vinegar dampening the cloths was not enough. Even if it did kill the stench, they still knew the stench was there, and they still knew what they were doing. Two of the men were untying the harness straps of one of the big durins from a trollic's ankles. Lance, squatting beside the body, had tossed back the blanket enough to reveal the trollic's shoulders and goat's nutted head. As Rand trotted up, the warder unfastened a metal badge, a blood-red enameled trident from one spiked shoulder of the Trollocs shirt of black mail. Cobol, he announced. He bounced the badge on his palm and snatched it out of the air with a growl. That makes seven bands so far. Moraine, seated cross-legged on the ground a short distance off, shook her head tiredly. A walking staff covered from end to end in carved vines and flowers lay across her knees, and her dress had the rumpled look of having been worn too long. Seven bands. Seven. That many have not acted together since the Trolloc Wars. Bad news piles on bad news. I'm afraid, Lan. I thought we had gained a march. But we may be further behind than ever. Rand stared at her, unable to speak. And I said I. He had been trying to convince himself that she would not look any different now that he knew who... What he was looking at. And to his surprise, she did not. She was no longer quite so pristine, not with wisps of her hair sticking out in all directions, and a faint streak of soot across her nose, yet not really different either. Surely there must be something about an eye Sedai to mark her for what she was. On the other hand, if outward appearance reflected what was inside, and if the stories were true, then she should look closer to a trollic than to a more than handsome woman whose dignity was not dented by sitting in the dirt. And she could help Tam. Whatever the cost, there was that before anything else. 
He took a deep breath. Mistress Moraine, I mean, Moraine Sedai. Both turned to look at him, and he froze under her gaze. Not the calm, smiling gaze he remembered from the green. Her face was tired, but her dark eyes were a hawk's eyes. I Sedai, breakers of the world, puppeteers who pulled strings and made thrones and nations dance in designs only the women from Tarvalon knew. A little more light in the darkness, the acid I murmured. She raised her voice. How are your dreams, Randall Thor? He stared at her. My dreams? A night like that can give a man bad dreams, Rand. If you have nightmares, you must tell me of it. I can help with bad dreams sometimes. There's nothing wrong with my... It's my father. He's hurt. It's not much more than a scratch, but the fever is burning him up. The wisdom won't help. She says she can't. But the stories... She raised an eyebrow and he stopped and swallowed hard. Light. Is there a story with an Aes Sedai where she isn't the villain? He looked at the warder, but Lan appeared more interested in the dead Trolloc than in anything Rand might say. Fumbling his way under her eyes, he went on. I... Uh, it said I said I can heal. If you can help him, anything you can do for him, whatever the cost. I mean... He took a deep breath and finished up in a rush. I'll pay any price in my power if you help him. Anything. Any price, Lorraine mused half to herself. We will speak of prices later, Rand, if at all. I can make no promises. Your wisdom knows what she is about. I will do what I can, but it is beyond my power to stop the wheel from turning. Death comes sooner or later to everyone, the warder said grimly. Unless they serve the Dark One, and only fools are willing to pay that price. Moraine made a clucking sound. Do not be so gloomy, Lan. We have some reason to celebrate. A small one, but a reason. She used the staff to pull herself to her feet. Take me to your father, Rand. I will help him as much as I am able. Too many here have refused to let me help at all. They have heard the stories, too, she added dryly. He's at the inn, Rand said. This way. And thank you. Thank you. They followed, but his pace took him quickly ahead. He slowed impatiently for them to catch up, then darted ahead again and had to wait again. Please hurry, he urged, so caught up in actually getting help for Tam that he never considered the temerity of prodding an eye said I. The fever is burning him up. Lan glared at him. Can't you see she's tired? Even with an angrial, what she did last night was like running around the village with a sack of stones on her back. I don't know that you are worth it, sheep herder, no matter what she says. Rand blinked and held his tongue. Gently, my friend, Moraine said. Without slowing her pace, she reached up to pat the warder's shoulder. He towered over her protectively, as if he could give her strength just by being close. You think only of taking care of me. Why should he not think the same of his father? Lance scowled, but fell silent. I am coming as quickly as I can, Rand, I promise you. The fierceness of her eyes, or the calm of her voice, not gentle exactly, more firmly in command, Rand did not know which to believe. Or perhaps they did go together. I said I. He was committed now. He mashed his stride to theirs and tried not to think of what the price might be that they would talk about later. Chapter 8. A Place of Safety While he was still coming through the door, Rand's eyes went to his father. His father. Thank you for tuning in.